uh, Rich invited me to, to kind of come and, and give a speech uh, to you guys to celebrate the uh, 20th anniversary of the starting of the web server project. Uh, and uh, uh, definitely, I've always been very uh, clear, it was really a group of us from day one. Um, and I thought I would take also the liberty to um, give some ideas and some thoughts about things that would, uh, uh, all of you might want to think about as we, as we think about the next 20 years of Apache. So um, uh, there is a, uh, the photo you've probably all seen that has the, uh, the feather in it and, uh, and those of us standing up at the 1998 Apache Con. Um, but one of the first uh, 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 news articles that kind of showed us and tried, uh, kind of portrayed this you know, rag bag kind of uh, band of, of rebels or whatever kind of thing um, appeared in PC Week in July of 97. Um, uh, those are only the five people who are, were part of the project who could show up with a couple of hours notice uh, to uh, 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 organic online's offices in San Francisco, um, and uh, I, it, it was the first one to kind of talk about: Are you, you know, are you familiar with Apache? You know, uh, if you thought the number one web server was uh, Netscape or, or Microsoft, you were wrong. Uh, it's this distributed group of, of Unix engineers. Um, and uh, uh, what I actually really liked about this was, um, in addition to like posing us as rock stars or things like that, um, was that sense that it was not just one of us. It was not just. Uh, uh, you know, coders sitting at their, their terminals, it was actually people with a sense of fun, people with a sense of, of community. But um, there's a guy in this photo as well that I'm really happy was, was here. Um, and he's kind of second uh, from the right. Uh, by the way, it's Cliff Skolnick here. Um, uh, Cliff should be around at some point. Uh, um, he's on the far right. But um, the guy next to him is Alexi Kosit. And Alexi, for me, epitomized um, uh, a really fun kind of side of, the, of those early days of Apache. And I think it still continues to this day. Um, Alexi had been a participant um, since very early on. He was always one of those uh, uh, developers who <clears throat> was very clear, very thoughtful, um, very uh, 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 really into new developers, helping them come up the learning curve, uh, working on documentation when that needed doing, sanding off the rough edges of, of the project, uh, and and really practicing you know what today we'd call nonviolent communication, right? But having a being able to have a conversation without somebody else feeling like they're on the you know they're in the wrong or, or feel bad for, for what they believe. So um, a couple of years into his participation in the project, actually just before this photo was taken, oh and by the way the photo was taken in the data center room at Organic where uh, the first uh, box that ran Apache.org was sitting. So pretty much right behind, <laughs> right behind us was, was the server. Um, so uh, Alexi sends this note just before this photo was taken um, uh, and, and he says, uh, you guys I'm really sorry but the level of my contribution to Apache the web server project might decline a little bit going forward because I've just been accepted as a freshman at Stanford University. And it was at that point that we realized that he'd been collaborating with us since he was a, a high school, late sophomore, junior, uh, and yet he had been not only you know, technically clear and, and wrote you know, great patches and such, uh, but he also was exhibit, exhibited these uh, communication skills and this, and this uh, character that uh, was really impressive to me. Um, so I, I, uh, this, was, this was really kind of the start, I think, of us trying to define a, a culture you know, that kind of was just second nature to us um, around this time was also what I'd call the Arab Spring of, of open source, 1998, when uh, everybody was looking for, for heroes, looking for like who's going to take down Microsoft, who's going to you know subvert this or that, right? Kind of the Arab Spring for the web at the same time. Um, but uh, but really, what um, uh, was part of this culture at Apache and where, where we really came from was something we inherited from an earlier organization, it's still around and still still charging forward, called the IETF the Internet Engineering Task Force, right? And um, th those principles, uh, the, there are a lot of different facets to it, but the one that I think really mattered the most to the participants was this sense of rough consensus and running code, right? Um, that you could have a technical conversation about the right way to do things, um, and that conversation should be fairly transparent. You didn't have to get everybody to agree. It didn't have to be designed by committee. Uh, people could move forward and, and, and work on things, but at the end of the day, if your code didn't run, um, and uh, uh, it, it just doesn't matter, right? If you don't have an implementation you can point to that speaks the protocol that uh, is really the standards that the IETF were defining for everything, um, I, I, if you didn't show that it worked in code, and ideally in two separate independent implementations, 
uh, you couldn't progress it forward to an internet standard. Um, part of that culture came because really in 95, the, those of us who were setting up websites or, or uh, uh, working with internet technologies kind of lived in, a, in this soup of software that came from people involved in the IETF, right? Uh, every successful internet standard to date has come from open source code meant to implement uh, these, these open protocols. Um, so SendMail, right? The reason why SMTP became the standard for email really was thanks to SendMail and a couple of other open source mail platforms, uh, simply making it easy for everyone to adopt, uh, being both a reference implementation, uh, but also production quality, right? Uh, we might uh, uh, laugh at the idea of SendMail being production quality, but it really was. It worked at the volumes of email we were dealing with at the time. Uh, likewise with DNS and Bind, right? Um, I, and, and Apache really carried that tradition forward, that sense of, you know, we could have people like Roy Fielding, uh, who is here, uh, working on defining that, the protocol. He acted as the uh, ch chief author of the HTTP 1.0 and 1.1 spec, I believe. Um, uh, and, and yet also at the same time, writing code uh, and helping us understand how the implementation uh, uh, affected uh, the, the standard and vice versa, right? Um, but it was also this sense that, you know, on the IETF mailing list, communities would form. People would meet four times a year, uh, face to face, uh, and they would, they would share ideas, they'd share a beer, uh, they'd uh, talk about what they were trying to accomplish, uh, but that what made the IETF work wasn't some master roadmap of, of what we want to accomplish and, and when and what it has to do, but instead um, the sense of a good process, a good community, um, a sense of uh, a, a lot of these things I'll talk about, uh, uh, and, and that out of that uh, comes healthy software. Right, uh, it comes comes good production quality software, and and so uh, as as we got going, we realized that this thing that was second nature to us, um, this thing that was kind of unwritten, unspoken, you know, maybe we should start to crystallize. And there was a uh, one incident um, uh, somewhat early on in a patch in the web server project's history that helped crystallize this, at least for me. Um, there was a developer who showed up from a large Unix vendor that specialized in graphical workstations um, that, um, you know, there's a couple of those, right? Um, who uh, had been a fan of the project for a long time, and, and he wrote a couple of us privately saying, great news, guys, I've just gotten approval from my manager to port Apache to our new 64-bit chips, right? And it's just gonna scream, and it's gonna make it so fast, and it's awesome, and I've already done all the work, so I'm, so I'm just gonna like start posting patches, and hopefully you, know, hopefully you guys can commit to getting it in, because my boss will be really happy if it gets upstream, and then we can take some credit for it, right? And we're like, all right, well, show up on the list and start posting some patches and we'll see what happens. So he posts uh, this 60 kilobyte patch file, right, which uh, uh, had a tremendous number of changes to core parts of the server, a lot of um, casts to 64-bit rather than true uh, ways of portably writing code. Like he truly did port it to his platform but, but kind of forgot about the rest of us, right? Um, and this 60 kilobyte patch within about 20 minutes, I think it was Dean Goddard who responded very politely for him. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, this is not going to work at all. Let's talk about how uh, a better way to do to do all of this, right? Um, and and the, devel the developer from this large Unix vendor responded, "Well, we can't really change much because this is the first patch of ten that I've got, and if we change the first, all the other diffs aren't going to work." And <laughs> It was at that point that we realized that you know, what, what we'd lucked onto here by simply having a process that long before the Agile ma Manifesto was Agile, right? Long before extreme programming was about heavy communication between individuals as you're working on the code and, uh, and, and, and this kind of tight feedback loop, um, partly because of the limitations of CVS. You couldn't have long running branches, right? So uh, pretty much you, know, you wanted to commit things pretty quickly if you were, if you were uh, patching from it or forking. Um, but some of that also engendered um, a culture of, of what I think what I think we could kind of say became a healthy software development community, right? So the first really important factor of that was, it was humility, uh, a sense amongst the developers that you might think you're you're um, really hot, but what you what you develop it doesn't really matter till it gets socialized, till it, till it gets accepted, till you can have a conversation about it. And the earlier you start that conversation, long before you have 10, 60 kilobyte diff files uh, to submit, um, uh, the better, right? Because because that increases the odds of making sure that it actually can get accepted and upstreamed and solve real problems. Um, you also need to have empathy for the end users, right? You need to understand 
who's going to be using this code and, 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 um, uh, and, and want to make their life easier, not just adding new features, not just solving your own problem and then ending because your contract ended and you've got to move on to the next contract, but actually thinking about sanding off the rough edges, uh, eliminating the paper cuts, um, but then also setting it up for the next point, which is you want new people in your project, right? You want to be able to, to uh, have uh, something, a pipeline of contributors who progress up this ladder from being just ordinary users to expert users, to expert users that help other users. And I want to note um, Mark Slemko uh, as uh, somebody who is also really critical to this. Mark contributed a few patches to the web server project, but he tr spent a tremendous amount of time on the Usenet news groups and on our early users groups helping uh, people get past the, 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 the really awful install process, understand the really awful docs. He was a tremendous force in helping grow those early days of Apache. Um, but, but there's this last Matter, right? Uh, average users, expert users, um, uh, somebody who helps other users, somebody who reports a bug, somebody who reports a bug with a patch, and then somebody who says, finally, I've got a couple of these patches and fixes, and I just want to get closer to understanding where the development's going. So they join the dev list, so they start taking on other people's bug reports, and at some point, you know, they, they've, they've issued so many pat, uh, diffs or pull requests that somebody says, well, okay, fine, we'll just make you a committer, right? Uh, uh, to becoming, and now we've got the PMCs, becoming a part of the core team, right? Uh, and each step up that ladder should be as easy as possible, right? It should be a function of, are you gonna spend the time to understand the tech and understand uh, the process and communication, but how do we make that um, a, a, a real flow, right? Uh, and a part of this as well is transparency. I mean, we kind of didn't have really the luxury of being able to spend a lot of money and have developers in the same physical place, we, uh, or, or have like a venture capitalist who would fund the web server project from day one and then you know, build, build a lot of stuff ourselves in, in, in both in the same place and for, for one, one company. We kind of had to be transparent um, because not only was it the most efficient thing, it was the easiest thing. It was easier to set up a mailing list with open subscription or a public CVS tree, a public website, than it was to, to try to lock things down and, down and decide who should be inside and outside. Um, uh, it, and so that transparency, that sense of uh, uh, if, it did, if the conversation, the technical conversation doesn't happen on the mailing list, it doesn't matter, right? If, it, if it, you can whiteboard things all day long, you can meet for, for, for drinks or, or at a conference, but if it didn't happen on the list, it didn't happen in front of the right audience. And that meant you could always go to the list, find the history of the conversation about a feature and understand why it was changed, right? Um, a few other quick points, carrots, not sticks. This is kind of the license uh, conversation but um, the Apache license was intentionally picked up, partly because we had some BSD types uh, like Ben Laurie, uh, partly because we had this IETF culture of we're just building this tech, we hope everybody use it, uses it. But there is also this kind of karma kind of thing I think a lot of us resonated with, which was we're giving you good tech, you, we want you to use it, you shouldn't feel compelled to give anything back. If you do, then when you give us a patch, we know it comes from the right place. You come to, you're giving it to us because you want us to upstream it, not because you're compelling not feeling compelled to do that, right? Um, and that made a huge difference, I think, in bringing on a lot of the, the big corporations, you know, that otherwise were somewhat allergic to, to that sense of obligation, and it ended up turning them into to really big contributors. Um, Independence and teamwork is kind of self-evident. Uh, self we were kind of all working as, as individuals, but, but creating something as a whole. Uh, none of us needed to work together. This right to fork that's in the license meant that we could always spiral off. Um, it meant that, <clears throat> and do our own thing, whether inside of this org or outside. Uh, but that, you know, we all really wanted to lift, lift, lift the boat. And then an, a kind of an essential laziness, which um, really we were smart enough to rebrand later as a duocracy. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, I was never a very good coder. Um, you know, anybody else in the uh, project can probably attest to this. And uh, you know, the small patches that I made, I think, were refactored and replaced pretty quickly. Uh, I focused, <laughs> I focused pretty quickly on the infrastructure, um, partly because I was the one volunteering a box and then two boxes and a few more. Um, uh, but because I was more into this idea of being sysadmin to the stars than I was about you know somebody running my code, uh, and and I just jumped in and did it. And uh, I have been following the infrastructure 
infrastructure community since then, and I and and I, I think it's absolutely essential that we've had paid staff there, and I I because uh, at the scale that we're managing these things today, volunteerism is really hard to reconcile with with 99% uptime. But I uh, um, I did that because I felt that was the best way I could contribute, you know, and and um, uh, the kind of the decisions that get made are made by the people willing to jump in and do things. Uh, I think is an essential aspect of these of these communities. Um, and so if you want a, a frame, who here gets the reference? Who wants to name the, the, just yell it out. Brazil, right, okay. So, um, I, you know, I choose a different movie every time I give a speech, sometimes it's Soylent Green, um, but, but this time I felt like the, the, the character that perhaps best epitomizes in my mind what we've built here is a network of Harry, Buttle, uh, Harry Tuttles. Um, <laughs> Well, okay, um, but <laughs> um, so Harry Tuttle is a heating engineer, right? Essentially a plumber, right? Uh, uh, who shows up in this film Brazil uh, as kind of the hero uh, uh, because he helps make sense of this, uh, 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 you know, uh, algorithmic bureaucracy gone horribly wrong um, by jumping in, you know, in the in the cover of night and helping people sort out the ducts in their in their in their home and in heating when ordinary bureaucracy, ordinary infrastructure, completely fails, right? And um, you know they don't expect payment or if they do, it's just donation or whatever. But he, like, he, get, he gets in, he gets out, and, and like, it's, it's, it's this stealthy kind of thing. And I like to think that we, uh, well, that in some ways the internet has been built by people like Harry Tuttle, um, and that's kind of uh, what, we've, what we've carried forward. But I think uh, to scale beyond those early days, those early kind of uh, uh, you know revolutionary kind of like let's let's keep the internet free, let's 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 be these kind of like wizards who stay up late to reference another book. Um, uh, uh, that there is kind of a secret weapon here. Uh, that um, as we grew beyond the web server project, as we went into interesting areas, we really needed, which is the the incubator. And I'm really happy that there's a session right after this talking more about this. But. Every time I describe to somebody how Apache works, I have to mention the incubator. Uh, because you can talk all day long about PMCs and nonprofit structure and uh, healthy communities, but um, without an incubator, it sounds like it just happens spontaneously, and we know that that's not the case. We know that there's, even if it's not a, there's, there's not a formal document that defines uh, the Apache way, or if there's not you know, some checklist, uh, uh, what there is is a community and a culture of taking projects, big or small, um, uh, you know, as, as big as open office, right? Uh, uh, and, and, and converting them into a project that works the way that we, we think they should work, that we like them to work. Um, and then also handling all the details, IP clearance, trademarks, all that kind of stuff. And this is what separates us from the crowd. This is what separates us, I think, from obviously the, the GitHubs and SourceForges, but also from other projects that uh, are more about driving a roadmap and, and less about uh, actually uh, uh, build, building interesting communities. So now I want to just talk uh, about three things. Uh, what, something I think the ASF must do, something I think the ASF should do, and then something I think the ASF could do. So uh, Ross uh, talked quite a bit about um, diversity, right? And, and we know we have something of a culture problem in the tech industry at large. Uh, it's, it's no surprise. Um, this is, by the way, who, who caught the premiere of Silicon Valley last night? Um, yeah, hi Denise. Um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, but uh, most people don't realize this is a documentary. This is not actually a fictional show. Like, there's way too much, uh, especially for me, that it's too close to home with Silicon Valley right now. Uh, but it's also not just about a geographic region. It's about uh, a, a community and a, and a culture, or a, an industry that is broken in a lot of uh, really big ways. And one of the ways it's broken is in uh, the gender diversity uh, and other aspects of diversity as well, but, but gender is the really big one um, for me. Uh, I, you know, and thank you to Ross as well for highlighting this uh, in, in his talk. Every week I have a conversation with a female engineer, a female founder, uh, a founder of, a company, of a tech company who is considering leaving the industry because uh, they, they don't like the culture in it. They don't feel empowered. They don't feel uh, that it resonates with them. And this is true for proprietary companies. It's true somewhat for open source uh, projects as well. Um, but there is a crisis here. This is something that 
you know, we've inherited. It's not, it's not new. It's something that, uh, but, but it, it has, the sense is that it has gotten worse. My sense is that, uh, that it has gotten worse. Uh, and it's really hard for us to understand how to address this. Ross came up with some very good suggestions. Uh, um, the two that I'd like to focus on is one that actually strikes more to the core of, of you know, of, of Apache. And I think, actually, even that photo from the early days uh, uh, kind of reminds me of it. It's very easy to accidentally allow the concept of meritocracy to become synonymous with cognitive bias, right? For us to think about the people that we work with, especially if we see them on a regular basis face to face and share drinks with them and get to know them as people, to not be able to separate that from the technical contributions, their technical talent, and to read their emails in a different tone of voice than we read emails from people we haven't yet met and haven't yet bonded with, right? Um, there's a lot of terrific content out there about understanding, you know, the, the dozens of different kinds of cognitive bias that I think it's worth your time, worth anyone's time to, to, to understand and read through. But uh, try to understand it and try to always have that kind of empathy to users and empathy to, to, to people coming into our community that uh, I like to believe is us at our best, right? And I think if we did that, that would, that would help substantially. Um, I think we also have to continue to seek out new users and developers and unlikely sources, right? Ross, again, had some good ideas on this. Uh, who here has been a mentor for Google Summer of Code? Great, thank you so much. Uh, some applause because that is such a hard job um, and is so critical to, capture, uh, to, to catching people at a very formative part of their career. Um, uh, likewise, uh, presenting at uh, uh, other conferences that are outside of the ordinary open source conferences, uh, supporting organizations like Black Girls Code and, 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 and others that are focused on getting uh, coding uh, ed education out there to, to a broader audience. Th these are all really important things to, to continue to do. So now let me talk about what I think the ASF should do. So uh, part of that founding team, uh, you know, I think uh, when we, when we you know, got together and started working on Apache, I like to say it was a mix of idealism and pragmatism, nearly a 50-50 split. The pragmatism was, hey, we had this earlier pre-existing web server, NCSA, that was working all right, and then when that team of student developers rightfully you know, quit school and went to go work at Netscape, uh, the rest of us kind of looked at each other and said, can we continue this forward, right? And so there, and we're using it, why not, right? Let's combine our patches. Um, uh, so there's that sense of pragmatism that with little modifications here and there and sometimes major contributions, um, we, could, we could get this done. Uh, but there was also this sense of idealism, the sense that we didn't want the web, which was still pretty early, um, to go the way of the desktop and uh, be 95% owned, as, as desktops were at that time, by one vendor. Uh, there is, and not to demonize anybody, it, you know, because uh, uh, times have changed, right? Uh, they change in different ways. Uh, um, but that sense of idealism and pragmatism, I think, is carried forward in a lot of our projects. But I'd like to reignite it a bit because this, this war has never won. Um, the platforms change, the names change, the companies change, but uh, people want get, to still get at the center of the internet and own it and, and extract rent for it. Uh, and we can't take... We can't take any layer of the internet for granted as being irrevocably open. And, I'm, and open source is one angle of that, open standards are another of that. But, you know, I, I see companies pitch, so I'm an investor these days, and I see companies pitch us all the time with business models that are essentially about owning a layer of the internet, right? Um, a lot of the Bitcoin community these days, the companies in that space are all about how do we take this awesome distributed decentralized thing and add an essential layer in between that everybody has to come to us for, right? Um, and there are even new commercial SQL servers. Like, I thought at one point, like, who would ever do another SQL server after MySQL and Postgres, right? Well, it, sometimes there's good reasons for that, and, and, and there's, there's commercial activity around that, and I don't mean to demonize that. But to the degree that, <clears throat> you know, uh, lay, layers of open source things make it easier to build open source things on top of that, uh, and, and, and that the, when you have an open source platform and an open source base of technology, you have a much more generative platform on top, you can do more with it. Uh, and to the degree that the internet won, and it wasn't AOL, right, um, these things matter. And, and I, I want you to think about the details on the last slide, you know, which technologies where doesn't, it doesn't matter so much as to, to realize we haven't won simply because everybody's using JavaScript, CSS, and HTML5, right? Um, uh, fortunately, Flash is moving on. Uh, sorry, Flex. Uh, but uh, um, uh, it, it's, it's, 
there are still battles. There are still, every time somebody writes uh, a mobile app for, uh, for iOS only, you know, I'm on Android and I'd love to try Periscope. I can't. Um, uh, you know, I feel like an angel loses its wings. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, so keep that in mind. Um, and, and this becomes especially important as we think about this, I want to say the long term, but this is increasingly near term, threats to what I'd call our civil liberties online, threats to the way that we relate to technology. Technology. Think about the fact, for example, that 20 years ago, we had the technical ability, forget about right or anything like that, merely the technical ability to take uh, a desktop computer and replace the operating system on it, right? That's great, right? Now, to replace the operating system on your phone, you kind of have to look both ways and make sure there's no authorities over your shoulder, right? You kind of have to go to a website, you know, that, that isn't necessarily, you know, uh, uh, on the up and up. You, you could potentially be installing something weird. Um, it's not, it, it's, 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 a, it's a feature that, it's a function that's going away, and it's partly because um, what was a technical advantage, I think we now need to realize is something of, a, of a, almost a human right, right? Um, so part of this is uh, the ability to know what the technology is that we're running on top of and not to start sounding like Stallman, but like when you are, you know, when your life is mediated by technology, if you don't have the freedom to look down that stack and see what that technology is doing, your rights are threatened, right? Um, your ability to drive your car where you want to drive it to, you know, is, is threatened, uh, to reference another funny scene from Silicon Valley last season. Um, so right now there is a war on our ability to communicate confidentially over the internet, right? Uh, and we need to be awake for that. Um, our ability to have control and sovereignty over our technology is in question. Uh, if there's one URL I can throw out, here, uh, there was an essay that Cory Doctorow wrote about three years ago uh, called the, war, the Coming Civil War Over General Purpose Computing, right? Where he talks about the fact that it's hard to, to um, root your phones, right? It's hard to root your car, uh, you know? At one level, it's hard today and, you know, may not get easier, but hopefully it will. Hard to root your doorbell when it's connected to the internet, right? Um, and this is a civil war that'll play out uh, over, uh, you know, commercial technologies, but increasingly over government policy over this as well. And we have a role. We have a role to play in building foundational open technologies that implement open standards to bend this arc, bend, bend these technologies towards uh, what I think would uh, serve all of our interests, right? So we, we, we used to joke, uh, especially in the 90s, that the geeks would inherit the earth to kind of you know, uh, riff on, on that line from the Bible. Um, and we kind of have now, which is a little scary. But now that's on us. Now we kind of have this responsibility, I think, to make sure that we're good ancestors. You know, that, that the technologies that come around, that in 20 years when we have ApacheCon 2035, we're able to look back and say, yeah, we've, we, we, we still have fought for and, and maintained that sense of control and sense of sovereignty over what comes from below. And two other orgs that, that I'm involved in that, that, that focus on this, the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Mozilla Foundation, which yes, they build a, a great web browser, but they're also really about the underlying stack of technologies, including increasingly Firefox OS, which is the mobile phone operating system, uh, that are about the consumer side of, of, of this story. Right? Um, the third thing that I want to throw out there and what I think the ASF could do, um, so the world needs more of us. Right? The world certainly doesn't necessarily need more open source uh, nonprofits out there, but uh, the world does need more membership-driven, community-focused software development communities. Um, uh, and as an example, uh, there's uh, uh, somebody here from Ocera, uh, 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 perhaps even a couple of people. Yes, excellent. Um, so Ocera, I can tell you a long story, but I've only got a few minutes. Um, Ocera is uh, basically the open sourcing of the Vista electronic health care record system written with our tax dollars, if you're a US citizen, um, to, uh, 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 for, for the Veterans Administration. Uh, this was something that was open, open sourced by Freedom of Information Act about 10 years ago. Um, and then and, and now has officially been open sourced by the VA working with a whole bunch of different orgs to try to build a new type of community of health IT practitioners, right? With the electronic healthcare record system as kind of the operating system for that, but hopefully a whole new wave of apps on top. Um, in health IT, in other sectors, in software for other government functions, you know, like we have 50 states with 50 different Department of Motor Vehicles. Why do they separately procure software? Why is there not just one open source DMV software or uh, tax authority software, right? Or water management software? Like, like 
I hear about these kinds of needs all the time. Uh, there's, company, there's groups like Code for America and, and uh, the GovLab and others that are helping governments better understand technology, open technologies and others. But there's still a, a lack of an organization that can sit at the center in a beneficent way like Apache has uh, and be a meta community for, for, the, for this type of activity. Likewise with environmental monitor, monitoring tools, civil rights tools, there's lots of individual projects, lots of things up on GitHub, lots of dis disparate uh, kind of activities. But what we've really done at the ASF, I think, is, is crack the code on this building a community of communities, kind of you know, uh, achieving escape velocity over Dunbar's number and figuring out how to uh, 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 have enough systemization and just enough process and just enough uh, standardization and how we launch new communities to create a much more productive, much more interesting uh, technical community and, and build some real things. And this is a, a gaping need out there. So I think, uh, I think what, if we could figure out how to take what's made the board work, what's made uh, the ASF work as an organization, uh, what's helped uh, other people understand us, and distill it down to a science, make it repeatable, we would have a tremendous impact on the state of technology in the world. And finally, thank you for 20 years of just awesomeness. Having 20 years of having something to kind of brag about uh, uh, to friends and, and, and always look at, even in the worst of like debates over, over uh, mailing lists and things like that, I've known that at the core, there's been this set of ideas and principles and people that have just been uh, awesome to even be affiliated with. So thank you for that. And that's it. Thanks, Rich.